it's really important to realize that almost all space technologies are dual use. So rockets or missiles, uh, satellites have military applications in, in many different ways. And we've seen right now, for instance, in the Ukraine, that American commercial systems, including imaging systems from companies like Planet and Maxar, are helping the Ukrainian army best. Perhaps you can start by introducing yourself. I'm Greg Autry. I am a visiting professor in the Institute for Security Science and Technology here at Imperial College London. I also serve as director and clinical professor for space leadership, policy, and business in the Thunderbird School of Global Management at Arizona State University. What do you think human activity in space would look like in 20 years? In 20 years time, I believe we will see people permanently living and working in space. And right now we're in a situation where you have usually about six people on the International Space Station at any one time, each of them there for perhaps a few months. I think we're going to see a change there with people on the surface of the moon for years at a time, uh, people doing actual work, managing manufacturing processes and doing full-time research and development constructing structures in space, uh, people will be in these circumstances in a much more uh, permanent basis. There are more space-faring nations and commercial entities than ever before. How is human exploitation of space governed? Currently, exploration and development of space is covered by treaties negotiated in the 1960s and 70s that were centered on governmental activities and don't necessarily fit well with the ongoing commercialization of space. I'm particularly concerned about the issue of property rights in space and the lack of sovereignty and consequently a lack of clarity of, uh, of rule of law on places like the lunar surface. We've got a lot of challenges uh, to face there. The United States has been enacting laws and setting precedents uh, to ensure its interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty will apply to commercial actors. Uh, meanwhile, in Europe, the Working Group on Space Resources at The Hague has also been trying to set some international standards. The Russians and Chinese have very different opinions on uh, how these things will work. So we're in a situation where there's a lot of opportunities uh, for resource development to benefit everybody here on Earth and create an exciting new Base economy, which will probably be bigger than the UK economy by 2050, but uh, it, it is a, a time of uncertainty. Which policy changes would you want to enact to further encourage the USA's new space economy? So the United States has done an excellent job in preparing for a uh, commercial space economy. The Commercial Space Launch Act, which was put into place back in the 1980s, foresaw the development of commercial rocketry and, and satellites and created a regime for permitting and licensing those activities. No other country really did that. And this is one of the reasons this commercial space boom has taken off in the United States and attracted uh, entrepreneurs and investors from around the world. Obviously, you've got Richard Branson running Virgin Galactic and Virgin Orbit. Uh, you have uh, companies from many other countries like the UAE investing. You've got Rocket Lab from New Zealand who moved their headquarters to the US and that's because they want to have a regulatory regime that is clearly defined. So that's good. Changes that I'd like to see uh, to allow the industry to continue to grow have mostly to do uh, with the right to extract uh, resources from celestial bodies, including the moon and asteroids, and to own or have property rights to the property that you improve so that that property can be financed and resold. And that's a real challenge under the interpretation of the Outer Space Treaty that many other nations have. What can other countries with aspirations in the space economy learn from the USA? So having a clear acknowledgement that there is a commercial space economy and that it's legitimate is important. If you look at Russia, honestly, they failed to exploit a huge technological advantage they had and a huge advantage they had in a uh, highly educated space workforce uh, to turn it into a commercial economy because they had a very government-centric view of space. Other countries 
particularly India, for instance, uh, and even China, are beginning to uh, stimulate commercial activity, but you want to have that clear regulatory and predictable legal environment for them to operate in. So as soon as possible, uh, to lay those rules out, both within your country and as an international norm that is uh, supportive of commercial activity is extremely important. How are commercial activities in space governed at an international level? So there's no authorization required to launch a satellite into space other than from your own nation. Um, and the United States, again, has a very clear regime for doing that for commercial entities. Most other nations are doing it only at the governmental level, so they don't even worry about that issue. There are liability conventions that determine that if you were to do something wrong, if you were to drop your booster uh, into a city, uh, as could possibly happen with the Chinese Long March rockets, which keep uh, playing uh, space booster bingo with the world, um, they would be responsible for that. That part is clear, but nobody can tell them that they may not do it. Um, right now, there doesn't seem to be any inclination, and I don't think in particular the United States or the UK would sign up with anything that told their nation whether they could or could not uh, do a launch. We do have to get to a point, though, where we have cooperation in tracking where items are and we know where uh, satellites are, which altitudes and inclinations their orbits are in, and at some point have a space traffic management system similar to the air traffic management system so that we are at least cooperative uh, in this regard. What are the main security challenges in space for nations and corporations now and in the future? It's really important to realize that almost all space technologies are dual use. So rockets or missiles, uh, satellites have military applications in, in many different ways. And we've seen right now, for instance, in the Ukraine, that American commercial systems, including imaging systems from companies like Planet and Maxar, helping the Ukrainian army best the Russians, the communication systems from SpaceX and Starlink have allowed the Ukrainians to continue their military and civilian communications in circumstances where the Russians have tried to shut them down. So there are definitely threats specifically from the Russians against commercial operators, and this could be real. You could have state actors obviously making threats against each other. The Chinese and Russians have done very destructive anti-satellite tests that created huge debris fields uh, that are very dangerous to everybody in orbit. Uh, Thankfully, the United States and the UK and several other countries have promised and pledged not to do that. We need to expand that. There are cyber threats in space, the ability to, uh, to intercept, jam, or spoof communication signals and uh, positioning and timing signals is, is very real. Uh, the ability to hack and take control over space systems is not unrealistic, although luckily that's not happened. And the other thing that really concerns me is as we begin to launch many, many inexpensive payloads into space, uh, and this is a great boon for researchers, uh, it becomes easier to conduct nefarious activities. When all satellites were made by Boeing and Lockheed and Northrop Grumman or some large company, nobody worried about what those satellites did because the specifications were very clear. Now you put 165 different satellites on an Indian rocket and it turns out that one of them was actually a payload that the United States FCC had denied a license to and so this company had just gone over to India to sneak their satellites in and, and they weren't into space. Uh, that's very concerning because things that were designed by malignant non-state actors could, could be in orbit. How do corporations in the space economy impact and influence national security? So the role of corporations in space from a national security standpoint, I think is very similar to the way that it is in air and in, uh, in sea. Uh, so there are certainly commercial actors at sea for whom the nations their ships are flagged under are responsible. Uh, these ships, uh, and the same with aircraft, can have interactions that uh, those nations need to, uh, to monitor and control. Um, you can have 
basically territory at sea that's controlled uh, by corporations when you look at oil drilling platforms, for instance. Um, in space, you have similar issues and similar potential problems where either two commercial actors or a commercial actor and a state actor uh, could brush up against each other in a way that was uh, um, not friendly and, and it would be unclear sometimes in space who had the right or even the capability to uh, interdict activities that were, were deemed to be illegal. Um, this is going to be uh, an evolving law space and in some sense being there sets the law. As we sometimes say, a possession is nine tenths of the law. If you if you have that territory, or you're the first satellite in uh, a particular orbit right now. Um, nobody else can get up there, so uh, you need to uh, to think about uh, the importance of moving in a timely manner if you're a nation or a company interested uh, in space. It's not that we haven't dealt with it before. I mean, if you look at for instance, the United States history, and this happened in other places like Australia, when you had a frontier and there was an unregulated environment that commercial actors began to move into, um, there were essentially little wars between companies that were running cattle ranches or mining and battles between the indigenous people and the railroad, right? And, and we're, luckily, we don't have indigenous people's rights to trample in space but you are potentially going to deal with situations where commercial actors will be by default laying out stakes, as we say, uh, particularly on the moon, where there are certain highly desirable areas of lunar resources that contain uh, ice, uh, which is an amazingly valuable chemical in space because it brings you oxygen to breathe and water to drink and, and uh, hydrogen fuel to run your systems on or where there are metallic asteroid cores. And right now, again, uh, under the Outer Space Treaty, there can be no sovereignty, and there's also no uh, personal or company uh, property rights. So if you have real property and you add value to it, you can't necessarily legally resell that under any regime, uh, which is a big financing problem that I'm concerned about. But there is essentially uh, an operational zone and you're not allowed to interfere with other people's operations. So if I set up a mine, theoretically, uh, another country or company cannot come in and try to grab the same resource, but where the demarcation is, is completely uh, unclear uh, under international law. And that I think invites uh, difficulties and potential conflict. Uh, most of the operations in space are gonna be uh, robotic autonomous systems uh, and because of the large distances in many cases and the time delays they may even be AIs uh, and this again invites complexities that we hadn't really thought about uh, where you have autonomous systems that uh, might interact with each other from, from different players uh, but I do think that if there were conflict, a great deal of it would be cyber-based. A great deal of it might be directed against ground communications and control stations as opposed to things actually happening in space. That said, uh, many countries, including the United States, uh, India, Russia, and China, have demonstrated anti-satellite capabilities. We're perfectly capable of removing other people's systems from space, either destructively or with directed energy systems to... Uh, to uh, blind them or, or damage them. Uh, the United States, China, Russia have probably systems that can go up and uh, uncooperatively dock with another satellite, meaning grab it, move it, perhaps even bring it back to Earth. Um, we could see these things happening, how countries or companies will react if their systems are, uh, are interfered with uh, in an aggressive way is uncertain. So. I worry that the space war escalates to more terrestrial war uh, if there were to be such a thing. In my opinion, we need to revisit the concept of sovereignty uh, on celestial bodies. The Outer Space Treaty chose to say there would be no sovereignty in an Antarctic sort of way, but I think with the vision that space was a place to explore scientifically and it failed to consider the economic development and the benefits that could bring back to Earth. Once you start having economic development in a zone, it's really good to have rule of law, meaning you know who is in charge of this area, right? Um, so whenever you have had in history 
an area where there was no rule of law, where it was there was no clear nation, you ended up with the Wild West syndrome, as they like to say in the U.S., and the enforcement of of law, uh, you know, basically fell to local strongmen. Uh, so we would, uh, I think, be wise to consider whether it makes sense to to create either new governments that manage designated uh, territories on the moon or asteroids, for instance, uh, or allow existing governments uh, to do so, so that, again, it's clear within this area what the law is and who's capable and legally allowed to enforce it. And to be clear, that's not a popular opinion uh, in the space community because there's a lot of people who like this kind of globalist uh, kumbaya, we're all going to work peacefully together, but history just doesn't support that. Uh, uh, that global commons model is being peaceful. You know, the alternative is that we would have some United Nations rule over uh, the cosmos and that they would have some expeditionary force to enforce that. But I, I see that as highly unlikely given the, the speed at which the United Nations moves forward and, uh, and their actual capability. So I don't think that's going to keep up at all with what we see happening in commercial. Do you see the commercialization of space as a land grab type situation? Yeah, I, I, we see that happening. And right now the leaders are commercial companies in the United States and the Chinese uh, uh, state uh, incorporated. Uh, and, and they are definitely moving quickly towards the, particularly the South Pole of the Moon where there's a lot of the water ice and where there, there appears to be a large uh, metallic uh, a deposit uh, that, that would be suitable for mining. And uh, as soon as people begin to establish activities in those areas, they'll begin to assert that there are exclusion zones around their activities. And, uh, it's very important that we keep communication channels open and make sure that uh, we, we try to reach some, some compromises on that. But I, I do think there could be mechanisms by, as I said, in a new government could be established by group of nations that would give authority to that uh, that body to implement rule of law in a particular area and allow claims for mining or, and other activities within those those areas, permit them and, and eventually, for instance, tax them to support the enforcement of the rule of law in that area. Yeah, and that doesn't necessarily mean human beings in suits with uh, with ray guns, um, but it could at some point. Uh, it, it more likely means that uh, that you would be uh, intercepted by some autonomous systems that are, are capable of stopping you from what you're doing. In some cases, we can leverage against actors in space with their assets and activities on Earth. But as we get farther into the future, we're going to have people who don't have activities and assets on Earth and we can't find them or uh, you know, uh, go after their board of directors because they're all on the moon. What advice would you have for aspiring entrepreneurs in the space sector? So there's a lot of exciting things going on in entrepreneurial space. Uh, I had a couple of students at the University of Southern California where I taught for years uh, uh, that I mentored who uh, had a great startup called Relativity Space and they've raised uh, over a billion dollars and have a $4.3 billion valuation now and are going to launch rockets. But I would advise most uh, new students not to go into that particular field. The launch field is really full. And because the launch field is full, there's a huge opportunity. We see the cost of launch dropping, both because we have new technologies, particularly involving the reuse of rockets as opposed to using them as disposable tools that are dropping the cost, along with increased reliability and better launch cadence, meaning they, they go faster uh, in turnaround time. Uh, and we get a lot of launches per year, so I think we've got 50-something uh, SpaceX Falcon 9 launches already this year. Many of these rockets have been used eight or ten times. Uh, this is changing the dynamics. We've gone from $80,000 per kilogram to orbit down to $5,000 and occasionally less per kilogram. If you think of a market where you've got continually dropping cost and continually improving performance, new applications are unleashed by that. It's very similar to Moore's law in the microprocessor market in the boom we saw in the 1980s, 90s, uh, with first the personal computer and then later the internet driven by this uh, 
increasing computing power at lower cost. So if we've got all this launch available, it's better and it's cheaper building satellites and finding applications uh, for uh, space-based uh, activities becomes much more accessible. So I would look at in-space manufacturing. I would look at uh, all of the communications, earth imaging, and the data that comes from that. What will the world be like when we have real-time information about every point on Earth or pretty close to it and can communicate that to every point on Earth? How does that change activities in Oceania, for instance? If you're living in Tonga, that's a different world than you've been living in uh, just a few years ago. Finding ways to take advantage of these, uh, these new uh, artifacts and uh, capabilities created by uh, space technology is going to be profitable and uh, hopefully do a lot of good for everyone.